High performance sport can be amazingly exciting when it's about human potential. I've been involved with nine Olympics in three countries as a cyclist, coach, scientist, and a manager. And a high performance sport when it's about human potential draws us in. And what can we learn from the best performers for us as high performance difference makers? My job is to lead the collection and the analysis of the story of how New Zealand's best athletes, coaches, managers, doctors, and physios prepare for big events. Olympic Games, Commonwealth Games, Winter Olympics, Paralympics, World Cups, and World Championships. And when you look at a photograph of an Olympic team, there's more than just the faces you can see. They've been mentored, guided for years, and they actually represent every team that's come before them. It's like a fern, and the story of them intertwines with everyone else. And so we record this story, and it's a very New Zealand thing to do. No other country's doing this. And we identify what they do well, what they say they failed at, what they succeeded at, and we give it back to them so they can learn. And why is learning important? Because in high performance, it's become far more competitive. It's harder to achieve a victory at the top. More countries are focusing on one event. And an athlete can move from a novice to a repeat medalist in four years. That's fast. And they may only last four years. That's their lifespan. So that's short. So they're in a hurry. So the more they can learn from everybody else as a record, the better their chances. And that's what we do. So we have a thousand people in the database and we're connected to the Dunedin study. So we thought we're gonna target the best in the game at this and mirror it. So we have a thousand people over 16 years, 100 international events. And when we add up everything they say, there are 63,000 things. So you can imagine a cloud of things. 63,000 things got their attention. So with sport, there's a day and a time. You can't delay, you have to arrive on time. So where you pay attention is your fuel. Time's your fuel. That's all you've got. So for 63,000 things, what really counts? Can't all count. So when we divide it up into performance and we look nine to 16 in the world, they talk about the most. Top eight, the ring narrows. Medalist narrows again, repeat medalists. Very tight, they know what matters, they figured it out, that's all they do. And it's not about taking the ring and giving it to this group, because that's not learning, that's a cut and paste. So it's about increasing the acceleration of the ring. They're exactly where they need to be. Everyone is where they need to be. It's just helping them accelerate to the center point and what really matters. So if we look, say, repeat medalists, and there's 75 of them in the database, there's 400 medalists, 150 of won top medals, and 75 of won top medals at big games and repeatedly. They have a system. And so what's in their circle? What can we learn from what's inside the circle? And there's seven things, seven learning areas that they have developed and learned. And when we look at the others, they're there as well. There's just giant stuff in each of those seven. They've narrowed it down. And what are they? The first is their environment, everything going on around them. Their family, their friends, the social media, their car, all that other stuff. It's simple, it works, and they're okay with what they can't control. They have routines. They're not trying to innovate every angle there is. They've got routines, and they keep them rolling. And where they're innovating is polishing and sandpapering the edges. They're not alone. A third learned behavior. 
There is no repeat medalist alone. They've got a coach, and we'll explain why they have a coach. But they have proven support team around them. The competition measures is another one. High bar, and they're always lifting the bar. Every time they achieve, you'll hear the interviews, not quite satisfied. Not bad, yeah, we did the job. But they're looking for the next one. It's their mindset, a little bit better, a little bit higher. How much potential do I have inside of me? And the event they're going to, they know. There's not hopes and dreams and, yeah, I know the day, I know the time, I'm fine. There is repeated rehearsal, scenario planning. They know exactly what they're walking into, no surprises. And the last two of those seven are about them. They are healthy and uninjured more often than everybody else. That sounds pretty basic in sport, but the majority can overdo it, overtrain. You may know people. It's easy to do that, but what they've learned is what works for them, my boundaries, and they stay within their boundaries. So that means they have fewer days off training. Whereas others, you add it up, probably 10% undercooked. And the final one, you hear the theme through the story, is learning. They have learned how to become learners, not just athletes and not just coaches. They are learners. They've learned how to learn. And we'll talk about that. If you look at one repeat medalist compared to the next, compared to the next, you see the seven, but you don't see the same things in the seven. So as we said, it's not a cut and paste, it's a cut edit paste. And the best in the world are not superheroes, despite what it looks like when they're interviewed and they make it sound like it's all come together, I knew exactly how it would work. It's not like that. It's not like that. And you get them beforehand, and you realize it's not like that. When the story's played out, it looks like I figured it all out before, but no. They've taken a step based on their best decision and another step but they know exactly what direction they're heading in. And the best performers have mastered what works for them. That's why they're high performers. They figured this out, they've personalized it, same with the coach, same with all the support, and the seven work for them and it'll work for nobody else. So looking at what you do, and how you're living, what's inside the really narrow ring? What's in there for you? Let's look at how they do this. How do they move through this period of not quite knowing what I'm doing to knowing exactly what I'm doing? And there's five stages they work through. This is proven in medicine, military. Dreyfus Brothers and Anders Ericsson are the two with giant research backgrounds in these areas. And so a, psych a, a sport example would be, first off, you've got an exercise. Do your arms, do your legs, do your back. And it's eh, eh, eh. The next level, you start to connect. The athlete starts to figure out, oh yeah, I know that's lower body and this is upper body and then I do some endurance. And The next level, there's a system starting to develop. They're thinking about, oh, I need nutrition, my sleep's got to work. Um, and they start to turn this into an ecosystem. The next two levels are where the best in the world operate. They tinker and redefine. So they're beyond just accepting a system and going through the motions. They're tailoring it to themselves, and they are completely redefining the area. And based on what works for them, that's how they redefine. And how does this happen? It comes through coaching. This is the story that we are, we are told out of all these people. A coach is a key, key person. There's no repeat medalist without a coach. And the reason is, like a great teacher, they point things out you would otherwise not notice. Because all of you, all of us, all of them are basically a blue dot on a blue wall. You cannot see the system you're in because you're in it. You're too busy getting on with stuff and they are too busy getting on with stuff to step back and have a look at, is this the right stuff? And the coach plays things back. Hey, have you noticed? You might want to try this. And, oh, it makes sense as soon as you hear it. But you're not always paying attention to everything because you've got to keep moving. And what are they looking for? What kind of things do coaches and athletes talk about? The analogy is like an iceberg. So on top, you've got the, uh, the beautiful white 
floaty bit, small, but you know the power is under the water. Everything that's holding that little bit up is under here. This is the stuff you can see. Things like an event, like this, you can see it. There's a pattern of things, patterns of behavior, patterns of events. That you can see how many times this has happened. And I eat like this, and every so often my nutrition goes kaput. And yeah, I figured out, ah, oh, right, it's the pattern that most of the new athletes, new coaches are there dealing with what they can see, fixing things, making problems go away, sorting out what they can already see. The next level, the ones really trying to redefine and tailor, are under the ocean. Under there is the system that creates this and the thinking that creates the system. So two analogies just to paint the picture for you. TEDx. So here's an event and we're all here. And there's a pattern, and you may have been to other TEDx events before, other things like this, and you may be going to the future, future events. And that, that's it, that's where the visible is. Underneath, that you'll notice once it's pointed out, but you haven't been, as we've been, you've been listening to some great sessions, is we've got walls that work. The building's not shaking, it's not collapsing around us, the ceiling's here. We know where we are. You knew the map. The roads work, your transport worked, you knew what the schedule was. The organizers have sorted out our system. We've been briefed, you know why you're here and how you got here. There's a whole system and change any of that, this may not happen above the water. Then there's the thinking, why did you step into that system? Well, what about this talk has triggered some interest in you? Do you know somebody? Is there a burning passion you've got? Thinking drives the system you walk into or create, which creates what you can see. And the best coaches and best athletes are under here. They're under the sea. And so in your life, as you're achieving your own potential, what's under the sea for you? What kind of things are you paying attention to in the system, the structure, and the thinking in how you go about what you do? These repeat medalists have done one other thing because we've talked about the preparation, but they have performed. So at the end, they've finished something. They've stood out there, and even if they're in a team, they are basically alone. When the ball comes to them, there is nobody else. So they have delivered. When the pressure was on, they've put it out and done it. And there's a difference between the repeat medalists and the newcomers in the performance spectrum. So in sport, we analyze the preparation, we analyze the performance, those two things, and how do we optimize them. So a beginner can, can, can produce when they've experienced it, been there and done that. The next level athlete or coach can perform when they've either experienced it or considered it. So they've talked about it, they've planned it. I've never raced in lane eight with all that chop and that crosswind, but oh, we talked about it, so I'm, I'm good. I got selected for lane eight, it's fine. The next level is in what's called flow. They are completely absorbed in the world, in reality. They're not thinking their way through this anymore. They're beyond, they're into creative reflex. They navigate whatever comes toward them. No resistance, navigating whatever comes toward them. And you'll have seen this in some of the sport events, the ones that really touch you deep inside. You can see, wow, this person's somewhere else. And they're really connected. They've learned to do that. This is not some born thing. Champions are born and then made. There's a combination. And they're born with exactly what we've got. But then they make with what they're made with. My Drysdale won a bronze at the Olympics and he had a really bad flu. Such a flu, they thought he was going to pull out and he won a bronze. And they interviewed him afterwards and they said, well, I guess next Olympics you're going to be healthy. And he said, no, that doesn't matter. Next Olympics, I'm going to have trained so hard I can win when I'm sick. So his attitude is completely different, navigating. So how do they pull it together? What's the final picture? What's under the sea of how they pull this together? The great performance with the great preparation. What's their thinking look like? What does all this story that we've recorded tell us about their, their thinking? And they see the world in two basic parts. Vision, this is what I want to create. 
and current reality, this is where I am. You think, well, that's not rocket science. Isn't that how everybody thinks? But most focus, and the newcomer athletes and the novice, focus up here at the vision, being crystal clear on the vision. I can see it, I can feel it, I'm energized by it. Here it is, I'm gonna get there. I am gonna get there. But down here is current reality, and there's some things that are really uncomfortable about current reality. And these repeat top performers don't dwell down here trying to lift it up. It needs to be exactly what it is. I can get here, from here, but what's the gap? What's the true gap? Don't tell me I'm a little bit faster than I really am, that I believe a little bit more than I really do, that I'm a little bit better than I really am. I am what I am and here it is. Because I am not here to fix this, I'm here to create this. So they look at this gap in perfect truthfulness. And despite what it looks like, they don't have consistent self-belief, consistent positive messages. There's a whole lot of just humanness in how they go about what they do. But what they don't do is pretend something's different down here at current reality. They don't try to fix here, they live in creating here. So what have we learned from the overall story? They have a structure to their learning. They've trained themselves on how to learn. They focus on creation, not fixing. And as they go on to achieve their own personal excellence, what really surprised us is what they think of themselves doesn't matter as much as what we thought. And what does this story, what parts of this story trigger your thinking? What resonates most with you as you make a difference in your own life and make a difference in your own work? Thank you for your attention.